Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today it's a feature story edition of Farm Week. You've probably heard of texting, tweeting, and Facebook. It all comes under the heading of social media. Believe it or not, it's affecting the commodity markets. Every state in the nation except one is being negatively affected by the recession. In North Dakota, find out why the economy is growing and taxes are being cut. In Southern Gardening, the Rex Begonia. Introduce it to your home during this holiday season. We will take one last look at the 2011 Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. It's the pinnacle of the Junior Livestock Show Circuit in Mississippi. And also, it keeps me in check of myself and what I'm doing and what example I'm putting out there for the younger people because they're looking up to us. And you can tell when they walk through the barn and look at you and want to talk to you that they really do want to know you and that you're important to them. So you really have to be a good example for the younger kids. Good day everyone and Merry Christmas. I'm Amy Taylor. And I'm Artis Ford. Welcome to Farm Week. Regardless of whether you celebrate Christmas or Hanukkah or Kwanzaa or all three, we hope you are having a blessed holiday season. Today it's a feature story edition of Farm Week. Our first feature story today is a look back at February's 2011 Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. Mother Nature provided quite an experience for those involved in this year's sale, but the dangerous weather conditions were no match for livestock buyers, families, and supporters of the big sale. The prestigious event still collected more than a quarter of a million dollars in sales and awarded scholarships to deserving livestock exhibitors. 4-H and FFA exhibitors at the Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions found that qualifying for the big sale would not be the only challenge they faced. But despite dangerous weather conditions, the sale must go on. Come rain, snow, sleet or hail, the week after the Dixie National Junior Roundup, one thing is certain, the Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions is going to happen. Bitter cold temperatures, snow, rain, and ice were potential threats to the health of beloved livestock. In addition, Mississippi State University Extension Livestock Specialist Dean Josan says travel was a huge issue for anyone scheduled to be at the Dixie National. Mother Nature caused a few uh, problems with us at Dixie National this year. We've had a couple of periods of snow and ice. Now, some of our main challenges have been getting our judges in. Uh, the airlines have been sort of quick to cancel a lot of flights and uh, with our judges coming in from all over the country, uh, we've had some issues getting them in. Joe San was glad that in spite of the obstacles, the sale brought a packed house with buyers, families and supporters prepared to brave the cold. Premier Exhibitor Scholarship recipient Michael Buckley says extra precautions were taken to protect the livestock. We had to put heat lamps on the hogs to make sure that they didn't get too cold because if they get too cold they'll start to lose weight and that's not very good. Um, we, this is the first year they've allowed us to do that in the barns because of fire hazards. It may have been cold outside, but the sale ring was a hotbed of activity. Sale of Champions committee member and ringman Harry Dendy talks about being in the middle of the excitement. We have three ringmen and they each have a, a particular part of the audience that they, that they work. And uh, you have to watch for bids, you have to watch for raised hands, you have to be able to tell when somebody's bidding or when they're waving at somebody across the ring. Uh, you just have to kind of be clued into what's going on. You're so hyped up and so full of adrenaline, uh, you don't get exhausted. Probably the biggest problem I have, about usually about two-thirds of the way through the sale, uh, I'll st I start losing my voice. Dendy says he's glad to have been involved in livestock as a young person. I was active in 4-H and FFA. I had livestock projects. Uh, fortunately, and when I got out in the job market, uh, the career that I chose, which, which was in farm credit, of course, uh, had, had the livestock uh, part of the farm credit system. 
In addition, Dendy claims his background helps him relate to exhibitors as he watches them grow. The sales total at this year's Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions was about $257,000. That figure includes a total of over $92,000 for the steers, $84,000 for the hogs, $55,000 for the lambs, and $25,000 for the goats. Five premier livestock exhibitors received scholarships of $2,000 apiece. Academic scholarships of $1,500 dollars were awarded to 25 high school seniors and three supreme animal exhibitors received $1,000 each. Harry Dendy says those who wish to support the sale but are unable to buy an animal can contribute to the scholarship fund. One of the highlights at the sale was the parting message from Marsha Barber who spoke about her experience as a buyer. This is her last year to attend as first lady but she hopes to be back. Michael Buckley describes how showing livestock has helped shape his future. I've learned just responsibility and taking care of my animals. I get up at about 5.30 every morning and go feed my hogs and my cattle. Um, I have to uh, walk my cattle daily. I've had the opportunity to go to Mississippi State and learn how to artificially inseminate cattle. So that's something that I've learned at a real young age and that I've, I'm getting better and better at as I go along and um, practice more. Buckley says he aspires to become a veterinarian. Academic scholarship recipient Libby Durst talks talks about what she learned from her livestock project. I learned how to be patient with the animals. When you're trying to get a cow to set its feet up just right for you, that's hard. They don't want to stand still all the time. And you can't get mad at them because they don't know what they're doing. So you have to be really patient. And also, it keeps me in check of myself and what I'm doing and what example I'm putting out there for the younger people because they're looking up to us. And you can tell when they walk through the barn and look at you and want to talk to you that they really do want to know you and that you're important to them. So you really have to be a good example for the younger kids. Durst says showing livestock also helped her decide on a career path. I really want to pick a career that allows me to be involved in agribusiness because it's so important to our state. And I think that's important for young people to know is just what agriculture does for our state and how they can be more active in it. Durst says her plans could lead to a future as a state representative for agriculture. Lauren DeMuth of Raymond talks about how showing livestock is a great family project. We get to spend time with our father and that's he loves doing livestock stuff so that's how we stay close with him. My daddy buys the lambs and buys the feed and medicine and my mom supports us and the whole thing so we really couldn't do it without them. DeMuth says winning reserve grand champion was just one of the many rewards in her project. She's taken away life skills like the value of sportsmanship and helping others. One of my friends has has like eight lambs and she gets some a champion drive then she needs somebody to help her show and so I'll help her. It's a great way to meet new people, different people from different parts of the state. Exhibitors say the most important life lessons involve learning from each other through teamwork and sportsmanship. Dean Josan says he's proud of the young people's exceptional conduct. The exhibitors have been very respectful of the judges and our workers that have been here attending the shows and, and putting on the shows. Um, it's always nice to see them come up to, to thank the people that are working the gates, working the check-in gates, and especially to thank the judge. Those involved in the Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions say the leadership and teamwork they learned helped them survive the threatening conditions of Mother Nature this year. From Jackson, Mississippi, I'm Amy Taylor reporting. If you are interested in watching this story again, you can go to our Farm Week website, farmweek.msucares.com. You can also find us on Facebook and YouTube. We'll also have links to the Market to Market website where you can see the story as well and read the script. That's farmweek.msucares.com. And of course, Artis, um, about a month and a half away is the next Dixie the National Sale of Junior Champions and, and a livestock show, and everybody's getting geared up already. Maybe it'll be warmer this year. Hopefully. <laughs> Our next feature story today is about social media and the commodity markets. If you thought social media was all about entertainment, you're wrong. It's beginning to affect the commodity markets as farmers and others in agriculture adopt the technology. Market to Market's Paul Yeager reports. I actually just went to get a glass of water and wheat had went from up six to up 26 in one trade. Tom Grisafi is no stranger to futures markets. A former floor trader, he currently serves as the president and CEO of the Indiana Grain Company. Despite his membership in multiple exchanges in New York and Chicago, you won't often find him trading on LaSalle Street. Hey, 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 there it goes, there it goes, there it goes. 
Instead, Grisafi hunkers down at home in a basement bunker of sorts, furnished with a dizzying array of TV screens and computer monitors. This week, though, a speaking engagement in Iowa required his RV to serve as the center of his trading universe. The mobile setting is particularly appropriate for Grisafi, who says social media, particularly Twitter, often influences his trading decisions as fundamental crop data moves from the field to the phone. Twitter's taken a real uh, active role with the uh, onset of all the mobile devices, iPads, iPhones, Blackberries, uh, staying connected. Everyone who has a mobile device has become a reporter. How, how a crop's progressing. Someone could be out in the field talking about uh, a certain field they're in and how the condition of that crop is or where the weather is in the particular area they're at. Despite its trendy moniker, Twitter is quickly becoming a social media phenomenon. Over the past year alone, the number of reports, or tweets, filed in cyberspace grew to 200 million per day. That's up more than 400 percent from 2010. But getting an accurate reading on the number of people using Twitter is sketchy. Some, known as lurkers, merely read the information and don't interact with others in the Twittersphere. And no one really knows for sure how many people with specific farm and agribusiness interests are using Twitter. But one thing is certain, social media is becoming a significant factor in trading. If corn's up tonight, then there must be only like a crop of 12.5 and zero carry out. If corn continues to go with the outside pressure, I mean, our stock market's literally collapsing in front of you. Grisafi spoke this week to a group of producers under the age of 35 in an event called NextGen. The initiative brings future leaders together to gather information on topics that will have an impact on their business and to network with peers and industry experts. NextGen is sponsored by Pioneer Hybrid, a major underwriter of Market to Market. NextGen class members examined some of Grisafi's marketing strategies and heard about one investment he claims is essential to a healthy bottom line. Has anyone here spent a lot on computers? Multiple monitors, screens. Anyone here spent a lot on a tractor? A couple hundred thousand? Everyone, right, combine? So I'm, I don't know what to say. I mean, it's just a talking point. Um, for my business, I guess my combines and tractors are these computers. While they represent an emerging trend, some farmers are embracing Twitter. Their postings often include pictures of their crop's progress. Some have a significant number of followers. And Grisafi claims data he gleans from social media reliable. I think so, as long as you are reading a credible source on Twitter. Of course, there's always people who could be uh, not legit or uh, maybe lacking integrity, but you figure that out quickly. During its session on social media, the Next Gen Group also heard from Greg Vincent, editor of Farm Journal Media and AgWeb. Vincent says Facebook helps drive traffic to the AgWeb site and noted that tweets are also telling a story. We're starting to see more people get engaged in social media, probably through a couple of uh, avenues. Number one is for information sharing, but also there's a big advocacy movement right now too of people, uh, farmers and ranchers, promoting agriculture and helping people understand what they do. One way producers embrace social media is through a weekly Twitter conversation called Ag Chat, which brings together a group of more than 10,000 strong. When you talk about a farmer perspective and how they can use social media, uh, it's a way for them to communicate what they do. For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager. And if you're interested in watching this story again, go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com. You can also find us on Facebook and YouTube. We'll also have links to the Market to Market website where you can see the story as well and read the script. That's farmweek.msucares.com. It's time now for today's trivia quiz on Farm Week. It's about peanuts and the amount that can be grown on an acre. How many peanut butter sandwiches can you make from the average acre of peanuts? Is the answer 1,100, 15,000, 22,000, or 30,000 sandwiches? I'll have the answer after today's Southern Gardening segment. Well, have you ever thought about using a plant besides the poinsettia for holiday decoration? Well, in this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman shows us the Rex Begonia can bring interest and beauty to holiday decor. The 
poinsettia may be the quintessential holiday plant, but there are other plants that are just as festive and deserve their own holiday cheer. Today I'm at Natchez Trace Greenhouses where they are growing some striking Rex begonias which are perfect for holiday decorations. Rex begonias are primarily indoor plants known for their colorful and textured foliage. The coarse textured leaves are certainly colorful with streaks and splashes of silver to cream to burgundy. There is a symmetry to the spiral shape of the leaves which adds to their beauty. Rex Silver Blush has an almost metallic sheen with its silvery edges and bright pink middles. The variety Reddington has red tinged green leaves on top with rusty brown bottoms. Rex Iron Cross has medium green leaves with a pebbled and quilted surface. The middle of the leaf features chocolate brown highlights on the center veins. A most unusual selection is Rex Escargot. The foliage has a curling snail-like pattern starting at the base of the leaf. Propagation of Rex begonia is as interesting as their varied colors. Whole leaves are cut and placed in growing media and new plantlets form at the base of the leaf. Direct sunlight can damage your Rex begonia, so always place an indirect light for the best growth and performance. I'm Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Gary says that uh, look around and you're bound to find a Rex begonia that you like. It's time now for the answer to today's trivia quiz on Farm Week. It concerns the number of peanut butter sandwiches that can be made from the average acre of peanuts. The answer is 30,000 according to the National Peanut Board. The board says the average child will eat 1,500 peanut butter and jelly sandwiches by the time he or she graduates from high school. We're going to pause now for a short break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll have the calendar and one more feature story for you. While the rest of the nation may be enduring the recession, it's not happening at all in North Dakota. It's lowering taxes as its economy grows. Prepare? I'd better be. After all, paying attention to details is what makes the difference. The more preparation and planning time I invest, the more successful and enjoyable the outcome. For everyone, I know everything can't be perfect. I don't expect it to be, but the time and effort I spent pays off when the unexpected happens. So yes, I prepared for my marriage until death do us part. Prepare for your marriage. Before we get back to, to our last story, let's look at the Farm Week calendar. The annual Delta Ag Expo takes place on Tuesday and Wednesday, January 17th and 18th in Cleveland, Mississippi. The doors open at 8.30 a.m. both days. It may be one of the best bargains you'll see this year because there's no fee to enter. The Mississippi Delta Farm Toy Show takes place Saturday, January 28th. The location is the Cahoma County Expo Center in Clarksdale. The hours are 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. There's no admission fee. Mid-America Farm Publications is producing its 15th annual ag production conference on January 31st and February 1st. Cotton, rice, corn, and soybeans will be covered as well as precision agriculture. The location is Harris Casino Convention Center at Tunica. 48 farmers, 58 researchers, and 10 crop consultants are scheduled to appear. We'll have a link on the Farm Week calendar to help you register. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out the latest Farm Week snapshot. Our last feature story today takes us to the only state in the nation that's not only surviving the current recession, it's growing like it never happened. North Dakota acknowledges the growth is due primarily to oil discoveries, but it's an example of preparation meeting opportunity. Market to Market's Paul Yeager reports. A recent study examining the U.S. economy state by state revealed a troubling development. Conditions are worse today than they were at the end of 2008 in every state in America except one, North Dakota. Citing robust job creation and increased incomes, Bloomberg's economic evaluation of states index ranked North Dakota 
number one. From the Red River Valley in the east, where the unemployment rate approaches 4%, to the oil-rich Bakken shale formation in the west, where less than 1% of residents are without work, North Dakota is the state the recession forgot. All of these areas are growing, and that's exciting for North Dakota, and it goes back to the basic decision to have a tax, regulatory, and legal environment where businesses can thrive. It's exciting for us. We actually reduced income tax by 20% last year in North Dakota for every North Dakota individual and corporate income tax by 20%. So we're doing well. While virtually every other state in America is mired in budget deficits, North Dakota enjoys a surplus of more than $1 billion. At just over 3%, unemployment is about one third of the national jobless rate. In the past 10 years, the state has added 50,000 new jobs. Wages in many industries are well above the national average. Some companies are offering signing bonuses. And the state recently hosted a workforce summit aimed at helping employers fill more than 16,000 job openings. We are looking for people to come to North Dakota. Uh, and, and part of that is we, we partner very well with the education system. Uh, however, we have to, to uh, be involved to try and bring the, the right workforce in and the right skill set in. And so we're, we're looking for ways to really enhance our workforce development and, and improve our training for the future. Everybody's fighting the baby boomer group and uh, we're, we're looking for the future on how we can skill up people in the right areas to be very successful. Agriculture is king of the North Dakota economy, accounting for nearly one third of the state's total economic activity. And the state's farmers and ranchers lead the nation in production of more than a dozen commodities, including spring wheat, sunflowers, and flaxseed. While an oil boom in the West garners much of the headlines these days, officials say oil is responsible for just one in three new jobs. And they say decisions made a decade ago have helped the state avoid a single sector dependence that spelled economic disaster for North Dakota and many of its neighbors during the farm crisis of the 1980s. I mean, this is different, folks. It really is. <laughs> it wasn't always this way. And uh, it's fun to explain to him uh, that it's not just oil and gas. Uh, that's what we're getting the publicity for a lot of days. But uh, really, it's all about our comprehensive approach, working on our targeted industries where job creation really takes place, technology, advanced manufacturing, agriculture, energy, tourism. Those are the areas that we identified 10 years ago as where our great job growth would occur. Policies nurturing diverse economic development ultimately resulted in the nation's lowest unemployment rate. Finding qualified workers to fill thousands of job openings, however, is proving to be a challenge in some sectors. There's a company up by Devil's Lake called um, Summers Manufacturing. And they've indicated to us that they want to expand their, their production facilities. They produce farm implements and they export them all over the world, right now to the Ukraine and different parts. So their greatest fear is that they can't expand in North Dakota because they can't find qualified workers. That's a great problem to have. And it, it's really ironic in many ways that a lot of places need to find jobs we need to find workers. So we know in the long haul, though, that we need to develop our workforce. And if we don't develop our workforce, when the national economy turns around, and it will, it may take a while, but it will turn around eventually, that we'll then compete for workers from all over. Much of the demand for workers in North Dakota is due to an oil boom rivaling those from days gone by in Texas and Oklahoma. A relatively new, and in some circles, controversial drilling method has unlocked heretofore inaccessible oil reserves in the Bakken Formation. The fracturing process, or fracking as it's commonly known, also is releasing an economic gusher. And if you're interested in watching this story again, you can go to our Farm Week website, that's farmweek.msucares.com. You can also find us on Facebook and YouTube. We'd like you to go there and like us. 
You'll also uh, have some links to where you can go to the Market to Market website where you can see the story as well and then read the script. That's farmweek.msucares.com. You know, I mean, one of the things about the oil discovery up in North Dakota, they say, Wall Street Journal quoted a guy that's really into it up there, that there could be 50 billion barrels. I mean, this is like a gigantic discovery, which obviously will help us in terms of energy independence. So, uh, but it's obviously helping North Dakota in terms <laughs> How could it not? Of, their, uh, of their economy. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in the future. Absolutely. Well, we are at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our next show, we'll have another feature story edition of Farm Week. Meet the man who designed two of America's iconic tractors. Harold Brock was the chief designer for the Ford N-Series and the John Deere 4020. You'll also go to New York City where the community supported agriculture movement has gone trucking. In Southern Gardening, see how the loss of a tree can result in a beautiful new landscape bed. For the rest of Farm Week crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Amy Taylor. Thank you so much for, wa for watching and happy holidays.